Sometimes, games die. This could be because a studio stops updating it and the community loses interest. Other times it's just the community deciding to move on to something new. The most common reasons I've seen is community backlash due to changes or lack of content over time. Sometimes though, it is completely at the fault of the company, as we'll see with the few games we'll be covering today. The dying video game, website, and chat room has been an interesting subject that I've been slowly covering lately. What is it that's so interesting about a place that users and players used to inhabit becoming completely empty? I like to think that it's the feeling of exploring history, albeit not so ancient history. It's the fun of exploring abandoned places, but in the digital form. There's also a nostalgia that hangs in the air of places once inhabited. The feeling of seeing a website that you used to go to daily, or maybe going back to a game that you played a lot as a child. There's a nostalgia to exploring these often forgotten online places. At the heart of it all are games and interactive worlds. The worlds provide the perfect landscape for this form of exploration, digital archaeology or sometimes internet archaeology. Without taking too much more time, let's start exploring some of the forgotten worlds or in some cases, worlds lesser known to the internet collective. The first stop on our expedition is a game that I remember playing a bit when it first came out. It's a game type that we haven't had the chance yet to explore on this channel. It's a driving game, which normally has little to no exploration. Well, exploration was one of the selling points of Ubisoft's The Crew. The Crew is an open world driving game with vehicles to buy, cities to explore, challenges to complete, and a story to play through. It was released by Ubisoft in 2014 for the Xbox 360, Xbox One, PS3, and PS4. It also had a PC release that could be played on Ubisoft's PC app. Well, we'll cover that later. The game focused entirely on being able to explore a condensed version of the US. You can see several major cities including Los Angeles, Detroit, New York, Las Vegas, and Miami. There are a plethora of smaller cities to explore and almost every region of the US is represented here. You can explore the west coast or maybe take a trip through the bayou. There are forests, mountains, swamps, and just about every biome for you to accidentally crash your car in. The game was rather popular, but there was one major problem with this game, which is also its greatest selling point. The game is online only, and I think you know where I'm going with this. The crew was designed so you can explore the world and complete challenges with other players and your friends. But since the game is online only, there was no way that Ubisoft would keep this game around forever, especially not with the sequels and spin-offs they could be making based on it. Ubisoft announced that on March 31st of 2024, they would be shutting down the crew's servers forever. This is the tragedy of online-only games, and an issue that game preservationists are trying to tackle day to day. It might not be so bad that the game was shutting down since the sequel uses the same map but with updates and more cars, except for the fact they will be removing the 20-hour story mode. So the single-player story that only exists in this online game is being shut down with the servers. If you bought this game physically for your console, it'll become completely useless following March 31st. The story is the primary reason for playing the game, with few players actively online, which is a tragedy. The story of the shutdown is only half of it though. Let's take a look at the game itself. I picked up a copy used for my Xbox One from eBay. It came a few days later, but I wasn't able to play it since I was still sick from whatever I got before Christmas. When I finally did start up the game, I was thrown right in with the message that stated that the servers were having issues and to expect online instabilities. It was almost a poetic start to my exploration. I played the game over three days. The first day I started the story, where you play as a guy that just watched his brother get murdered right in front of him. Then you go to jail and are eventually let out by an agent that wants to work with you in catching your brother's murderer and other members of their gang. The story was something you'd expect from a racing game or a Fast and Furious movie. High speed settings and lots of cop chases. Pretty fun stuff overall, but not what I was interested in. Perhaps I would go back and finish the story before the 31st. It would be my only chance to experience it after all. I got to pick my first car. I picked a Nissan because it was the first real car I owned. Not my favorite, but it holds some sentimental value for me. Then I started to explore the map. The map has to be unlocked by driving through unmarked sections. Once you reach the edge of a new part of the map, you unlock a square of it. This means that you just need to drive around to unlock the rest of the map. At first I decided I would drive east to New York, since the game started me in Detroit. 
It wouldn't take long, but I've read that it takes 45 minutes to drive from one end of the map to the other. A drive that would feel slow and boring unless you happen to see other players. The world of the game was blurry as I raced by, going over 100 miles per hour down every road I could. I raced off the main road and onto the highway to start my drive towards New York. There are loads of NPC cars blocking just about every junction. I raced past tons of these NPC vehicles. Most of them looked the same, which I kind of expected from a Ubisoft game. It had rained during my travels and the roads remained wet. They didn't seem to bother my driving at all though. They visually just looked like puddles clouding the road. There wasn't even a different driving sound for moving on the rain covered roads. Ubisoft really knows how to sell you a believable world. As you drive through the different areas, you'll see challenges, but most of them aren't very fun. I did find one that I liked where you had to stay on a dirt road for as long as possible. It was fun, but my car couldn't handle it. Definitely needed to change cars, but I had nowhere near enough money to buy a new ride. I took a detour off the highway and drove through a little town hidden in the trees. There was farm equipment, some houses, and I saw the only other player that I would see that day. He drove by quickly and when I went to turn around and follow him, he'd already sped off, totally ignoring me, as if he couldn't see me. The little town had little to offer, so I fast traveled back to the highway and struggled driving around with all the new NPC vehicles littering the road. I tried to run this bus off the road, but I couldn't. Every car I ran to actually just seemed to stick to me and keep going, only slowing me down a little. There were a few that I knocked off the road though. I made my way to New York for the first time and saw that the city had its suburbs and downtown represented. It didn't appear to be exactly how it was in real life, but they tried I guess. There are a lot of areas to explore in New York, but I decided to go back on the road and go south. I wanted to see New Orleans and the bayou, hoping for some interesting sights. I made it and drove down this dirt path that took me alongside the water. Dirt was starting to kick on my vehicle and muddy my screen. These are cool details, but they didn't really matter to me that much and actually made it hard to focus on the road, though that's probably the point. I made it to a ranch house, but saw no one was there. It was completely empty, save for a rusty car in the back and a few on the other side. There were a few older style homes that I found. This one actually had people at it too. I destroyed their fence and then ran over their table before leaving. You can't really hurt NPCs in this game. They always avoid damage somehow. I continued my trip into a little town up the road and found a rich looking house with some maze gardens. The gardens had stone statues at the center, but nothing else. That was the end of day one. Not a bad start, got to see two major cities and explore the world a bit. I had an idea of what I was looking for on day two, but that would have to wait. I needed to charge my controller and take a break. Day two came and it was time to make my way to LA. From where I was, it would take a long time driving just to see coast to coast. I was located in the south, so it wasn't exactly a coast to coast drive, but still it would take a while. I started by driving up into Dallas, as I wanted to unlock a bit of the map before heading west. I've never been to Dallas, so I have no idea what it's supposed to look like. Though all of the major cities in the game kind of look the same, only the smaller ones got to keep some of their personality. It might be because Ubisoft is a French company, but I'm not sure how they went about designing their cities, really. I drove to some oil drums, I guess a monument of Texas, and then kept driving past them. Each city had markers that they wanted you to check out. Some of these were very cool tourist destinations, but for some reason Texas's were just the oil fields. Not exactly my first tourist destination. They're pretty out of the way too, I had to drive over dirt roads just to get to them. I took a road in southern Texas as the highway only wanted to take me south. I would need to merge onto another road in order to head west. I was also noticing something odd. On this day too, I was seeing less NPC vehicles crowding the roads. Now this could be a realism thing. I was in New York, so of course there were thousands of vehicles everywhere. I've driven through Texas once and I was on the highway forever without really seeing any cars as I drove to New Mexico. Only semis seemed to occupy the roads with me. Seeing less cars made it easier to go top speed for my entire drive, but also made it feel more lonely. I started to pick up some challenges on the way, which give you car parts. I would auto-equip any that I unlocked. I never bothered to read what they did or anything. After a while of driving, like 15 minutes, I finally found another town. I was in El Paso, which I've also never been to. I can imagine this town is more like its real world counterpart though. There are a lot of Mexican flourishes in the building designs and the aesthetic of the town. The small towns seem to have had more love and care put into them for some reason. 
I got out of El Paso and continued my drive west, but took a detour towards the mountains. I hadn't seen the terrain yet and was curious. So I took a bit of a trip up this dirt road and planned to see if I could have my car get some air time by driving off of a mountain. Though, on my way to the mountains, I ended up in a small coastal town. I must have taken a wrong turn somewhere. I drove over the beach and found nothing of interest. It was a pretty little town, if a little empty. I took another bit of the highway while it rained heavily on me and noticed something odd for the first time. There were now zero cars on the road. This was near the end of day two of my exploration. Somehow as the days were going on, the highways and towns were getting less and less populated. It's almost like the game world was starting to reflect the real state of the game itself. The game was dying. There were hardly any players, but now even the NPCs and vehicles were leaving too. Before it felt kind of lonely, like driving through a game that had useless bots following you for realism alone. Now it felt empty. I was speeding down roads that warned of cops, but I never saw a single one. I got a message about voiding other vehicles, but that would be impossible as you'd need to have other cars around to avoid them. It was turning into a lonely drive down barren roads, save for the occasional name tag of a supposed other player in the vicinity. I finally made it to the west coast and the mountains I was trying to find earlier. I drove up and did my best to crash my car and destroy it. Sadly, I wasn't able to. I narrowly avoided every tree not trying to and brought my beaten and bruised car to a stop by this rock. It wasn't going to happen, so I drove back to the main road and continued to LA. The sun was just starting to set as I made my way into the city. It was kind of pretty in a way, but also strange as I didn't know they had a day-night cycle in the game. The daytime hours last forever, while you get very little of the actual nighttime. Though there are stars above as you drive, which is nice in its own way. As I drove into South LA, I saw something I hadn't seen for hours. I saw actual other players. There were four of them. I saw them zip by as I got myself stuck while trying to do a jump. I have no idea what they thought as they just seemed to ignore me. I eventually caught up to them and drove next to them. I tried my best to interact with them, but somehow I was ignored again. The players that I'd encountered had all treated me the same as well, as if I was invisible. Maybe I was. It felt like every player I'd seen was more of a ghost than the NPCs. They were clearly playing the game, but they seemed more like ghosts of its past than people in its present. The sun had finally set and all I could see above was the moon. I drove around with nothing but street lights for company and saw how different this game was at night. Night driving has always been a fascination for me. I'm not sure what it is about driving at night, but everything feels quieter, more still, and more haunting. The usually busy streets were now less busy to the extent of no other activity. I drove outside of LA and found myself taking in the ambiance of the night. It was a bit creepy in the way that traveling at night can be. I was totally alone on these streets, just me, the sounds of the car, some crickets, and the occasional sound of a plane flying overhead. I felt like I could have any manner of creature creeping out of the woods near the road to attack me. Maybe I'd see a skinwalker or a knot deer. The possibilities felt endless. But all I saw were a few regular deers and a coyote. That was really all for my exploration of the crew. Well, except for one last point of interest, I needed to see for myself. There's an Easter egg in the game, one that takes you to the southern section of the US. I made my way over to hill country, driving through the night. The roads were more empty and devoid of life than a single player Minecraft server. The drive wasn't so bad. I even stopped in the town before driving up the path. By the time I had arrived, a morning fog had set in. I didn't know exactly where to go for this easter egg, but I knew it was here somewhere. As the morning fog faded, an overcast sky greeted me. It began to rain, which added to the ambiance of the secrets I was trying to record. I drove into the woods, crested a small hill, and saw a lone vehicle. Driving up closer, I see that a car had been abandoned and a newspaper was floating in the sky. Driving up close to it, you can read what the header in the paper says. World ending with text underneath that is extremely hard to make out. It's a bit creepy, but what's worse is on the right side of the screen. To the right are a pair of legs sticking out of a bush. It appears that someone has decided to take this newspaper's headline to heart, and they'd also decided to get a head start before the world did it for them. This is such an oddity. This type of Easter egg existing here feels right. Games hide this stuff in them all the time. It's what makes them so fun to try and find. But taking into context what's happening with the game and everything, this is more than poetic, more than ironic even. This NPC knew that the world was ending, and decided to go before the game world did. At the end of things, we should have known that Ubisoft would eventually shut down the game's servers. 
It's been almost 10 years since its release, but this easter egg has been here since the start. Clearly they were warning us of its end before we got too attached. Now what exactly do they want us to do about it? The Crew is a game that I think has a lot going for it, but lacked a lot of features that the two sequels now have. The game may be dying, but at least the world is still alive. For the most part. There are a lot of things that will be lost when this game goes offline forever. The story, the exclusive vehicles, and this easter egg. The secret was altered in the sequel, removing some of its darker aspects, like the body. I enjoyed exploring the crew. It was an interesting look into a game that blends the open world with a massive map. All that's left to do is to make the drive from coast to coast. Moving on to our next game, we have an MMO of sorts called Continent of the Ninth Seal. It's an action MMO that comes to us from South Korea. I found this game while browsing Reddit for abandoned games. It was a recommendation, but I wasn't expecting much of it. There are a lot of games that come from Asia that die in the West. For one reason or another, these games come out and receive very little support. They just sort of exist in a vacuum where there's a fan base in the East, but none in the West. C9, as the game is now known, is a dungeon crawling MMO, kind of. It falls into a lot of early 2010s MMO trappings and looks very similar to other dead MMOs. The game was published by South Korean studio Webzen and Volof, and published by Volof. This all is according to Steam. The game is an action-adventure MMO, kind of, hybrid similar to games like Black Desert Online, but a better comparison would be Dungeon Fighters Online, for a reason I'll be discussing later. The first thing I want to mention about this game is the number of players currently online. On Steam, there are zero players online, except for me, so there's one now. That is according to Steam. As I saw some chat messages appear in the chat box, but never saw any of those players. The max amount of players that play daily according to MMOPopulation.com is 185. That number will fluctuate as when I was playing it said there were 10 players online, though I never saw any of them. These numbers might appear abysmal on the surface, but considering most of the game can be played solo, it's not the end of the world for them. Let's talk about the actual game now. Firstly, you'll need to make an account and then a character. I usually like to run either a speedy character like a thief or a rogue, or a melee magic character. In this case, the spell blade seems right. Clicking on her, I saw that she was actually called a witch blade, and the game did the thing that a lot of Eastern MMOs do. It made the classes gender based. I had to play a female character, which isn't that big of a deal to me really. Though while I was making her, I realized that this game definitely wanted to reach a certain demographic. The character creation tools were limited, and no matter what, you were making a Barbie, so to speak. She was perfect in every way, and the other faces didn't change much. It wasn't until I started the game that I realized exactly how sexualized they made the character. From the movement to the closing choice, it was 100% what I expected from a South Korean game. Just like how Black Desert Online has insanely perfect looking characters, this game makes you have a beautiful character no matter what, which isn't really a problem, honestly. I struggle making characters attractive, which is why I usually just make an ugly character. After making a character, you have to play a tutorial that teaches you the basics. But I somehow got stuck in this main town area and just dropped the tutorial. Now I was finally ready to start the game. You start in the town that you were supposed to save in the tutorial. There are NPCs that say some of the most NPC energy dialogue I've ever heard. Other than them, the town is free for you to explore. And this is when I found out that this isn't an open world MMO like WoW, BDO, or FF14. It was an instance based one. Even so, the starting town had zero other players to interact with. I wandered the empty streets and saw just NPCs staring blankly in whichever direction they were programmed to face. I did some of the basic quests and found that they were pretty uneventful like most MMOs early on. You just need to complete and collect as many as you could to level up your character and find new gear. This would be maybe okay if I wasn't completely alone out here. I was able to go to dungeons and collect loot, hoping to find some good looking gear for my character, but alas, she wasn't allowed to wear any clothes. Not really anyway. I continued to complete quests and kill mobs until I could hopefully explore the other towns. Maybe there were a few players in them. But what I found out was that you couldn't see other towns until reaching a certain level threshold, one that started at level 24 and went all the way up to 60. There were four other towns, but I would never see them as I was level six, which took me an hour and a half to get to. All in all, there wasn't really much to explore anyways. Just another dying MMO, but one that feels like it hasn't fully been abandoned. There are updates still coming out, 
The game might have an audience in South Korea, but the NA audience has been apparently reduced to nothing, with not much to explore. The only other topic worth touching on would be the dungeons you have to explore and complete. They are very basic, at least the starting ones, which is kind of to be expected, though they were literally just hallways that led to nothing. You can complete each dungeon with combos and such to increase your score from D to S, I believe. At the end of the day though, there really isn't much to see. Maybe I'll have to return to it so I can see what the other towns are like, but if they're as dead as the starting one, I don't think it'll be really worth my time. I say we get to our next search. Our next game takes us to a familiar looking layout. Virtual Paradise is a game that was heavily inspired by Active Worlds the game I explored in my first video of this series. Active Worlds was actually the game that made me want to keep looking for hidden worlds within the internet. When I heard about this game's existence, I was immediately excited for the possibilities. Before we really delve into Virtual Paradise, I want to make it clear that this isn't a dead game. This is an online sandbox game that was created for the community that uses it. It never had thousands of players and is now reduced. No, it's pretty much always had a small number of users. That's exactly how many VP was created for just for those small few. VP was created around 2005. The game was created by Edwin, who leads the entire project. He also updates the game still to this day, with a new update dropping as recently as the 1st of January 2024. I knew very little about Virtual Paradise before starting my exploration. The wiki doesn't list some of the information I was looking for, such as the release date. I did find this information, though, through exploring the game. There's also a Discord and an official forum for those interested. Since I had little to go off of, I decided it was best to just jump in. This meant that every discovery would be something new to me, which can be really exciting but also be really slow moving. Finding points of interest might be rough, but we'll take our time and see. I loaded up the world and was met with an interface that I've seen before. It was an almost perfect recreation of the window from Active Worlds. You had the chat below, the options to the left, as well as the many different worlds to explore. There were 19 to explore, which was less than available in Active Worlds. I loaded in and saw an interesting LZ, or landing zone. It was a city at night, which was pretty spot on for the vibe I was looking for while exploring. The buildings, trees, and grass textures immediately jumped out at me. They were leagues better than what was available on Active Worlds. Something that also jumped out at me was that I was greeted by another player. Graystripe was their name, and they were very friendly. I introduced myself and explained that I was just doing some exploring, which led to them giving me a tour of the world. This would be the first time during my exploration where someone directly walked me around the world. I wasn't expecting a tour, as I usually like to explore alone, but I wouldn't say no to the offer either. I explored the main area for a bit, called Blizzard, before being teleported to a new town. This town was called Pine County, and had a very familiar feeling to it. I felt like I had just walked into Silent Hill, or Twin Peaks, or Alan Wake. The town was nestled in tall pine trees, surrounding it almost like a veil. I started on a road that looked vaguely familiar, but it was most likely just the vibe the town gave off. I started my trek around the town, trying my best to capture the aesthetic of the place. There was little to no sound, which added to the lonely feeling, but sound could also have made it a bit more ominous. There appeared to be a bunch of police cars, fire trucks, and pedestrian vehicles blocking the end of the road, likely the way out of here. I continued exploring until I found it, the place that I was always meant to explore, whether in real life or the virtual one. It was... Waffle House. As the prophecy has foretold, I could not escape this place. All jokes aside, this is a perfect recreation of a Waffle House. My new friend guided me to the Waffle House and showed me the controls for the game, which were pretty easy to use. You can run, walk, fly, and pass through objects, which made getting around super easy. Once inside the Waffle House, I saw absolute chaos, which is the norm for these kind of places. I saw some NPCs chilling and the dog from Silent Hill 2 for some reason. There also seemed to be a man that was being sacrificed at the center of the kitchen area. I left through the back door of the building and was met with a gruesome sight. There was a man on the ground being attacked by what looked like a zombie. The NPCs surrounding the scene all reacted differently. The attack was slow going but still a bit ominous. No blood though. Leaving the Waffle House in the distance, I caught some shots of the town. It perfectly reflected the kind of place I was hoping to find when making an account for this game. Pine County is actually part of the main Blizzard server, so my chances of just stumbling upon it were pretty slim. Luckily I had a guide, but there's still more to see, so let's continue. Next I was taken to the Google Pyramid. This giant pyramid was carved out in its own area. It's pretty impressive, 
but it was even bigger on the inside. The second we entered, the reception desk took to us. The same Sheba from before was here to greet us, along with his cat. Directly to the right was a blood-stained wall and a head without a body. The other NPC was quickly mopping it, but I had no idea what this was supposed to represent. I guess it's just another accident on the job. Big tech companies don't have time to care about every employee that is murdered, I suppose. I was then guided further into the building. Once inside, I was shown a picture of a majority of the regulars for the game. There are 14 members that I could see, which was a majority of them, I was told. Not all of them, though, which means there were more likely around 20 players that used this game. Everyone here seemed so close and really enjoyed the freedom of creation that the game allowed. The developer was also shown in the image, Edwin. All of their avatars looked slightly different, but a few had a sense that they came from the same game. I walked back around the town and caught more glimpses of the world. There were genuinely pretty shots that I could get. The models were equivalent to a PS2 game, and that aesthetic worked very well in its favor. I actually found myself wanting to create something in this world. Maybe someday. Next we explored some of the shops available in the town. The first was a gas station that had a strange sight going on around its corner. There were two NPCs in full body armor looking down the alley at a girl smoking and holding a shotgun. Beneath her feet was a blood stain. If you approach her, you can see that she is quivering. Next I was taken to the homes of my guide, enjoyed by another member. Their name was Nekohime, and they were also a regular. This also led to Edwin saying hello, which means I've met the dev of the game, as well as a few of the other regulars. The first house belonged to Greystripe and was styled in the decor of the late 80s, early 90s. It felt like it might fit that vibe well. From houses I'd seen in movies and on TV, it looked like a home straight from the era. There was even an SNES in the living room, ready to play Star Fox. Before we moved into the next house, we saw a church that looked like it hadn't been used in years. I was told that it just wasn't finished, but I like to believe that whoever ran it went missing. Gotta add some story to this town to match the aesthetics. The next house we went to belonged to Nekohime. Outside, it reminded me of a 70s home with a modern flair. The inside was very modern, though. The most interesting part for me, though, was the basement. Once you enter, you'll fall into the void. Our next destination was Chime Rock, which was another small town. The town had a different design from Pine County. This felt more like somewhere I've seen and been to before. It all felt very familiar. And I wasn't sure exactly why. This was also the first town I explored during daylight. I found out how to switch from day to night and did that immediately. I grabbed some really interesting shots of the decaying buildings and the stars. It made for a great transition piece. There were a lot of pieces here that could be considered liminal. I think that's just kind of the vibe when you move through abandoned cities and these kinds of sandbox experiences. While exploring some houses, I found one with what looked to be a murder scene. There was a neon glowing paint, but I couldn't figure out exactly what I was supposed to do with this information. I floated below and found an unused room that was definitely planned for something. I would just need to return someday to find out what. The final place I explored on my first day was a rainy town called Rainy City. I know, a little on the nose. But it was most likely just a test for adding rain to other areas later. The rain was loud, as in there was actual sound for it. It was also very visually loud, especially when you walked through it. Part of the map only had half of the rain effects. It just had sound and water on the ground. It might have been an issue with my PC since it was running the game at almost 1k FPS for some reason. I had to fix that on my next visit. There was a hotel that I explored for a little bit, but here's where I would end day one of my exploration. I seemed to have found a lot with the help of some friends I'd made, but I would definitely need to make a solo dive next. Day 2 was here and had a better idea of what I wanted to do and where I wanted to explore. Before I started my exploration, I ran into some of the players of the world and decided to do an on-the-spot interview. I needed to know more about the game before I proceeded forward. I learned that the game had been around since at least 2005. It was available in some form or another, but this was from a member and not the creator himself. The game was a solo project, which I gathered before, and was created more as a side project for fun. The game's servers were also run out of the creator's home. The community that currently resides in the game were members of Active Worlds before they left for various reasons. One of the biggest reasons was the requirement to pay in order to create things. 
These games only pull in people who love to create and interact. Taking away half of that or putting it behind a paywall is a good way to lose people. The users in Virtual Paradise are a close-knit community that just love creating and hanging out. The main server, or world, that most hang out in is called Blizzard. I covered it a bit before, but this is essentially the place to create everything. And there's plenty of space for more creation still. And each area in Blizzard feels distinct enough from the others. The default town of the one that you start in was created by Graystripe. It was called Somerville, and it's a great place to start if you want to explore VP. And important to note is that it was actually started in Active Worlds before being moved in 2013 to VP. There are also loads of Easter eggs and secrets to find. Most of them will be references from what I've heard. So with the interview done, I started exploring the game again. I started with a secret passageway that extended through some dark tunnels. This was created by another user that wanted to craft a story for this adventure. I was told they were experimenting with what they could create using the game's tools. The design of the area reminded me so much of early Valve games. It felt like I was traveling through a level in Half-Life. The tunnels were small and there was an NPC to talk to. The NPC had the same name as the person that was creating this experience. Interestingly, I was able to talk to this NPC and they had actual dialogue for what I answered. I guess a lot of games have that, but it's interesting to find it here. I continued through the tunnel and found that it was just too dark to see anything. I had the game set to night the entire time, which might be why. A few lights could easily fix this though. As you travel down the tunnels, you'll see different areas illuminated with differing lights. There's a section where you can free fall and seeing the different lights everywhere was actually a really cool visual. The tunnel eventually ends with a void that is meant to be expanded later. It's a cool experience to see what the game has to offer and know that the small community is still adding to it. I next went to an area in the basement of the Google building and found a secret entrance. The wall opened with this switch and had a ladder leading down into its confines. Once at the bottom, it appears to be a homage to Portal 2 and the Ratman dance. There were even cans with beans written on them. I then ended up in a black void, my new favorite place to explore. I saw a random NPC sitting off to the side. There's also a car just sitting here. I floated past the car and toward the NPC and clicked on them. I was then met with the only jump scare this game has ever given me and pulled into a face-to-face -face with this NPC. I couldn't escape him and he didn't say a word to me. I tried to click and leave but couldn't. Eventually I was able to escape by teleporting to the LZ. That was enough excitement for me honestly. I wanted to never see this Baldi's Basics looking monstrosity ever again. I finally decided that it was time to explore the main hub. This is where most of the game's foot traffic was going to be. So I started walking in a random direction to see what I could see. I started in a park and found some hollow buildings. It could have been a parking garage. Across the street was another building that looked like the one I'd seen before. There was a full night sky to accompany me on my exploration too. The only thing I really saw on this path though were these two buildings situated next to each other. Also there was a bit of pop in here. It wasn't long before I found my first site of interest. There was a large boat docked in some water. There was a sign that read, Hotel Titanic. It was a recreation of the Titanic apparently imported from Active World some years ago. This is because the server that hosted the boat was taken offline, so this was done in order to preserve it. Which is something I can totally get behind, as preserving pieces of the internet is what this channel and series is all about. I explored the Titanic for a bit, but it's mostly pretty empty on the inside. It looks cool still, but lacks anything to interact with. It does make for some really good looking panning shots. This game has the tools to make that sort of thing possible. It's still a pretty impressive sight. I started taking the busy road and saw a U-Haul in the distance. It looked just like any U-Haul building I've ever seen in real life. But that's not what really caught my eye. No, that would be the mall across the street. The Palm Court, as it was called, is a turquoise building with a neon green sign. Malls are one of my favorite places to explore in video games. From Dead Rising to Zomboid and The Sims, malls are just a great setting. I was a little disappointed to see that it wasn't finished on the inside, but I loved the concept behind it and promised I'd come back to see it when it was finished. I found a gas station and started searching to see what it had. There's a working soda machine that you can drink a coke out of. There's also another Silent Hill Shiba here, but you can interact with this one. If you click on him, you'll hear a song. 
I can't play this song because it's copyrighted, but it's the intro song from Ruby, the animated series created by Rooster Teeth. I then grabbed some visuals of the store. The aisles looked very realistic and familiar to me, almost like I've seen this in real life, which I probably have. I got some panning shots of Somerville and decided to check out one more place on my journey. I walked through a wall and no clipped out of reality. Well, I'm here again. There's a backrooms area created in the game and it's a fun bit of exploration. The sound of the buzzing lights isn't too loud, which is nice, and the look of it is very reminiscent of the first image that was on 4chan. You can explore here for a while, there are even a few points of interest to check out. The most interesting is the pool room, which oozes liminality. I can get lost in a place like this so easily. Liminal spaces are some of my favorite aesthetics that the internet has popularized. It's likely why I also enjoy games like this, as the liminal feeling can really take over and it's easy to get lost. With that, I bid farewell to my new friends and left the world. Virtual Paradise was not at all what I was expecting. I was expecting to find a virtual sandbox similar to the other two I'd already explored before. In both, I had been mostly alone, just left my own devices, and to take a look at the world that people used to explore. That was fine for those, but here I got the guided tour. I also got to explore on my own. Really, I got to see what VP had to offer. The community was friendly, the worlds were interesting, and overall there's a lot to see if you go looking. There's probably thousands of tiny details I missed while exploring, and even more that I never even got close to seeing. Which is why I need to take a trip back, to say hello to everyone again, and start to unravel whatever mysteries the community has laid out for us to find. Thanks everyone for watching the video. It's fun to explore gaming worlds that feel like they only serve a niche audience now. Less fun when a game is being ignored or shunted by its studio. Game preservation, media preservation of any kind really, has always interested me, especially when it comes to the things that we all experience and interact with online. Hope you all enjoyed the searches we did today, and big thanks to my Patreon supporters. Thank you to everyone who watches my content. I really couldn't be doing this without all of you. I have big plans ahead of me, and hope you're all ready. Take care everyone, and have a good night.